cried to before his face into every city of the place where he himself then would come at a later date. And therefore he said to them, and listen to the words now, he said, the harvest is truly great, he said, but the laborers are few. He says, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into the harvest field, or that he will thrust forth or cast forth those laborers. In other words, he's desperate. He's desperate now. He's desperate for leaders. He's desperate for laborers that will go forth simply because the harvest is ready. Everybody shout, the harvest is ready. It's different if the harvest wasn't ready, but the harvest is ready. Now there's, a, there's this, there's this uh, uh, darousness, there's this deep desire on the inside of the Lord to get the thing, get the people moving because time is running short. The harvest is ready. When, he, when, I, when I read this uh, in, my, in my private devotions and I read it, for the harvest is great, this thought immediately come to mind and I wrote it down, which really became the, the, the uh, emphasis of where we're going tonight. But it simply means that the opportunity for greatness is now before us. Everybody shout that. The opportunity for greatness is now before us. Opportunity for greatness. To do things we've never done. To have things we've never had. To be in places we've never been. Our opportunities are about to unfold before us. God is saying this is our time. This is our breakthrough. This is the year we've stepped into it. That things will begin to happen. So I took time on preaching this in two, just in two different areas. One is that the opportunities of greatness is there. I began, it took me two weeks to teach you this. And it took, there's things that you have to have going on the inside in order for to get out there where the harvest is. Number one, you'd had to have a burning desire. How you know it's God is because it's not just a desire, it's a burning desire to serve Him, to go places, to do things. It just won't leave you alone. You get it, you put it away for a day, but it's back a week later. It just, it never seems to go. You can quench it, put it down for a month, but before you know, whoop, here it is again. Another opportunity. You say, no, I don't want to do it. And you walk away one year, the same opportunity comes back again. It's a burning desire and it's God talking to you. You have to have number two, which is spiritual perception. You have to see it like God sees it. If you see it in the natural eye, you wouldn't touch it because it's too big. It take, costs too much. It's, it's, it's you know, I, I'm not intellectual enough. I can't handle it. That's your own vision. You got to have spiritual perception to understand this is the Lord and He is asking you and there's nobody like you. Look at somebody say you're something else. Take spiritual percep perception. It'll take number three, and that you have to maintain an open mind. The problem with human beings is once we hear from God and we get focused, that's us. We automatically close ranks. We blinker ourselves, and so we have it all. We have God all figured out. He's coming this way. He's going to give it this way. It's going to work that way. And when the minute you blinker God, you've cut him off. Because the minute you do it, you close your mind to every other thing. What I find is, if I try to tell God how to do it, you know, if you would just touch him, God, if you'd talk to him about giving me the finance, talk to him about opening the door, you know what happens? You wait for years, nothing ever happens. And while you're looking this way, God's over here doing it his way. So I stopped telling God how to do it a long time ago, and I just give him the needs or, my, or whatever I need to desire, and I say, thank you, I know now it's on the way. And if you stay open, God will use places, people, and things to get it to you. Absolutely. He'll use people that you didn't even like two years ago. Look at somebody say, but I like you now. He, he'll use difficult people. He'll use people that wouldn't talk to you a year ago and suddenly they'll come up and say, I was just thinking. And you're thinking, I was just thinking too. But here they come and they sort of bless you. because Do not close your mind because God, all, all avenues is open to the Lord. I said this in them two meetings that I did. I said that you cannot afford to have resentment in your life. You can, listen, people will offend you. They can't help it. It's a nature that they have. They'll say things, they'll do things, and they will offend you. It, that is the achievement of the enemy. He wants to get you offended. If, you, if he moves you over into a place called offense, then you stop dead. There will be no harvest. God can't use you. you ju you're just washed out. You're finished, and you'll just go through life wondering what it was all about. Allow no offense. To, to, to take root on the inside of you. It will become a bitter root and it will choke you and it will, it will make you miserable and, and you'll criticize and become negative about everything. You'll be a worry, one of them worry warts and you'll not even know what life's going on around you. You've got to stay clear from the resentment. Look at somebody say, I forgive you, I forgive you. And then I said this one and we closed on this, I closed with this one. Don't box God in. 
The title that I used, to the, the, the subject title was this, there's more where that come from. Because no matter what blessings you've got, it doesn't end there, God has more. He has more, and I remember reading that in the scriptures where God talked to, talked to David one time and he says, I took you when you were a nobody, I took you when you were a shepherd boy, I took you whenever you were just minding sheep and I brought you from there to the palace, I give you the kingdom, I give you wealth, I give you money, I give you friends, I give you everything. And then it didn't end there, he said this, and if that had not been enough, I would have given you more. And the day I looked at that, I underlined it, and I said, I wonder what the more is. I see what David got with his wealth and his happiness and his homes and his palaces. I see that. But there's other bits he never got. And I looked at that one day, and I said, I wonder what pieces I haven't got yet. There's more. Everybody shout, there's more. If you think you've touched the, big, the top of God's barrel, you must be kidding you probably haven't even scraped the bottom of God's ball. What he wants to do with you, what he wants to do for you, let me tell you something. He gave heaven's best to gain you. And now that you surrendered and he has a hold of you, do you think he wants to treat you like crack pots? Do you think he wants to lift you up like you're some piece of china with a big crack down and say, well, I will maybe use that later and discard you? You're the real thing. Look at somebody say, I am the real thing. Do you think God has wasted time molding you and shape you to make you into a nobody and throw you in a corner for the next 40 years? No, the neighbors might do that to you. Hell will do it to you. The devil will do it to you, but not God. God's interest, your interest, is at God's heart. And he's always trying to better you. He's trying to release you. And if there's something harming you, do you think that's God's will? I can tell you, sir or madam, that is not God's will. God is out there putting roadblocks in front of it to barricade you in, to guard you and protect you. He has given you weapons of the warfare. He gave you the name of Jesus and said, every devil in hell is afraid of that name. Just begin to use it and push that darkness back. God is on your side. And so you need to understand that tonight. And we dealt with that in two, se two sessions. I want to jump over onto this one where he said the, the harvest is ripe. The opportunities of greatness has now presented themselves to us. But he got on and said this, the laborers are few. And here's where we're going to this. And he said this, he said this, but then pray ye to the Lord of the harvest. Pray ye. Everybody shout prayer. prayer. There is no harvest. There will be no harvest unless you have a prayer life. Unless you've got your prayer life together, it just simply is not going to happen. He said, I, I, we, the harvest is right there for us. It's there. It's closer than you can imagine. But, the, but the, one that, the one that will separate the boys from the men is the prayer life. If you want to reach it, if you want to touch it, it's like a cloud hanging over us in 2016. Not a negative cloud, but a rain cloud from God himself. And it's those who dare to pray and to reach up and to grab and hold of, well, the one that will become saturated. You'll get, you'll get signs, wonders, and miracles while the people down the road are scratching their head and going through turmoil and wonder why they're not getting their share of the pie. Because they never took time to listen to, the, to the, what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. You know what I find the most amazing thing? when you read the book of Acts chapter 1 and chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost hit, when the move of God really started from, from the Jews right across and up to chapter 10, we're over over into the Gentiles where the, 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 the power of God began to move through human beings. And it began to tell you in chapter 2 then how the first century church began to uh, explode and, and evolve. And, and it tells you in detail what the church was like in them days. And I tell you, it's a long way off what the church is today. It's not like it was today. I tell you, when God moved, people, people's heart became so receptive, they began to move it. It details it. They fell in love with each other. They would forgive each other. They get up and do tremendous things. And the Bible says they continued steadfastly in the breaking of bread, house to house, communion, communion with people. And it said that they continued in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship. So you, can, you have to come to the fellowship. But he said in one day, they continued in, the, in the, the, the apostles' doctrine. And I used to read that real quick and think the apostles' doctrine was almost what we would call the apostles' creed. Or, 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 or it is what the canon of the church has decided. This is what Christian foundation is going to be. And I always thought it was that to study and end it not so long ago. And I began to find out that's not what it is at all. That's not what the apostles' doctrine was. Because the apostle doctrine was this, that the apostles have the ability to operate in the office of prophets. And a prophet's job was to hear what the master was saying. 
and begin to prophesy it to the people. And so the uh, 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 apostles' doctrine was simply what God was saying to that specific church, what his mandate was for that hour for that church. Now, what he was saying to this church would differ from the needs to this church. Are you with me? The church over here in Jerusalem, well, a big city, inner city church, ha had a different need from the church of Ephesus. And God had two different goals. They were out on the borders. There was more mission orientated. And let me tell you something. So the Spirit of God was dealing individually with churches, with the whole groups together. And all you had was people that would see, hear, hear what God needed to say specifically for that group, group of people. And they'd write it down and they'd say, that's what the doctrine of this church is. This is the mandate. This is what the Holy Spirit this, this said this church is for. So we need to know what our mandate is. You need to know what God is asking of you. You need to know what the direction of your life is. Because if you can find it, you will have an anointing on your life, God will bless it. The favor of God will come upon that specific area. And the Bible says they continued in whatever God was telling them to do, and God began to add the increase. God began to add them on a daily basis. They began to walk into a harvest. They would have money. The Bible says they would count everything common. They'd meet each other's needs right, left, and center. Their money wasn't their own anymore. God would talk to them. Say, that one's got a phone bill. Help them out this week. They'd come into church next week, and God would say to them, there's somebody over there needs, needs, a, needs a, a loaf of bread. And they would meet needs. And the whole church became alive. Moving in the gifts of the Holy Ghost and, and seeing signs and wonders. Long way off from what it is today. But nevertheless, I really believe we're coming back to a time when God will reinstate half of those things and get it going again. But one of the major things is this, is called prayer. If we do not pray, we will have no harvest. We will just get through like we always go through. The difference between last year and this year will be your prayer life. If you've got one, keep going. If you haven't, get one established fast. There, is no, there will be no harvest without that prayer life. Abraham, in the, way back in the book of Genesis, Abraham prayed. He was able to intercede for a whole city, and God answered him concerning the cities. The man called Daniel prayed even when the king and the law said, you cannot pray anymore. We do not want you to pray aloud. Evidently, that guy wasn't whispering in a corner. He wasn't having a little mumble and praying to himself. No, he was, being, he was opening the windows and praying, and people could hear. And they changed the whole laws just to stop him from praying. You know, there's a, there's a societies out there, and there's a community out there would want you to stop praying. There is a devil who doesn't want you to pray because prayer is direct communication to the Father. Will you make supplication? And prayer is two-way. You talk to the Father, he can talk to you. You've got to learn that. But Daniel prayed when they said, don't do it. And the Bible said he prayed three times a day until they took him and they locked him up and they were going to kill him simply for prayer. I wonder what type of prayer life you have because maybe yours isn't challenged right now, but if you're going to do, if you're going to have the breakthroughs, if you're going to receive the harvest, then you've got to establish that prayer life of your own. Uh, David had a, a prayer life, and I, I would say he didn't have a prayer life. I would say he had a life of prayer. I remember when I first got started and doing mighty things in the kingdom of God. I used to have, young people used to come to me at the time because I was a young people's leader, and they'd say to me, well, uh, how do you set up your prayer life? And I remember looking at them and saying, what do you mean? They said, well, do you pray two times a day? Do you pray for one hour, 30 minutes? It baffled me because I'd really not been asked that question. I thought that's strange because I never had just a prayer time. I had a prayer life. In other words, everywhere I was going, I was talking to the Lord. If I was in the car, I was talking to him. If I was doing shopping, I was talking to him. When I get home at night, I was talking to him. But you say, Joe, but what about the specific needs? I'd talk to him on the bus. I'd talk to him when I was walking. I just never stopped talking to him. See, when I got married to Laura, I never stopped talking to her. I didn't just talk to her in the mornings and talk to her in the afternoons. I didn't stop because that's a relationship. If you stop your communications, you'll stop your relationships. So from that, I got born again over 30 years ago. I want to tell you, I haven't stopped talking to him. And he's never stopped talking to me because he's always got something to say to you. I've always something to say to him and he's always something to, to say to me. David said it. He wrote a lot of it in the Psalms of what he said. Others you just pick up in the stories that he's wrote about his life. The Apostle Paul prayed. He actually said at one time, I pray in tongues more than you all. He would just pray, 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 pray. The master himself, the Lord Jesus, had talked about continuously talking about his prayer life in the, uh, in the scriptures. It said many times, he rose up early. Sometimes then he stayed up late. You need to choose what you want to do. 
He's, he, sometimes he stayed up, stayed up, he got up early. Sometimes he stayed up late. Sometimes it was all night on the mountains talking to his father. You know what I find that if the Lord Jesus needed to have communication with heaven, don't you think we need to do the same? And his prayer life was such sometimes up early in the morning, sometimes it was late at night, sometimes it was all night, all night. Everybody shout, all night. Sometimes it was all night. The Bible tells us sometimes he stood to pray. Sometimes he kneeled to pray. Sometimes he rejoiced when he was praying. Other times he wept when he was praying. And you, my brother and sister, we have got to learn to do the same. We have got to have a prayer life if you and I are going to succeed. It was a man in another generation called John Wesley who said it this way. He said that he's made this, this declaration. He said, give me 100 preachers who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God. And I care not a straw whether they be clergymen or laymen. Such, a, 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 such alone will shake the gates of hell and set up the kingdom of heaven on earth. God does nothing uh, but an answer to prayer. Did you get that? God does nothing except in the answer to prayer. So we have got to get this. There's somebody else said one time, prayer moves the hands of God. If there's no movement in your life, you may find your prayer life is not what it's supposed to be. A, a prayer, a 10-minute prayer day does not keep the devil away. Sometimes you've got to switch the TV off. Sometimes you've got to separate yourself and do it. I, I, I preached a sermon many years ago, and it's been the order of my life. It's called The Secret Place. You've got to find a secret place. You've got to establish a secret place. You've got to find somewhere in your house or in your back garden or somewhere that you can continually go to and meet with the Lord. And know that's the reason you're going there. You're going there specifically. You say, I can pray anywhere. I know. But if you will, if you will specifically have a seat or a, a room or a place where you specifically meet God on a consistent basis, it takes about two weeks of doing it and it becomes a habit. But you will find there's a place where you can meet the Father. It will become your secret place. And your secret place is where God will meet you. It will become as like your hiding place in your time of refuge, in your time of trouble. When your head's near busting, as we say, when your world's going crazy, you, you'll just long to get to that one place because you know when I get there, God will hear me. He can hear you in the car. He can hear you in a submarine. But there's just something about the secret place. I have a teaching on that somewhere, all the scripture reference that you're ever going to need to there. But the Bible says in Psalm 91 and verse 1, He that dwelleth in the secret place. That means it's continually there, in this place that he set aside to meet with the Father. Do you have one of them yet? Do you have one? If you don't, you got to get one. Set one aside and say, I'm going to meet the Lord in my bedroom, or I'm going to meet the Lord in the spare room, or I'll meet him in the bathroom. you got to find somewhere that's quiet. And you meet him, say, I will be here. You don't have to come at the same time every day, but you do, you do. If you don't set up a secret place, you'll probably never have a prayer life. But if you'll set up a secret place, Psalm 91 says, He that dwelleth or is continually in that habitual place, that secret place, is actually abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. So he's right there. When you get there, he's right there waiting on you. And, there, he's, and in there you begin to say of the Lord, Hey, you're my refuge. You're my strength. You're my fortress. And in you will I trust. There's a place. There's a place called the secret place that, brother and sister, you and I can establish anywhere. Anywhere. And if you will establish it, there's something about going there that's different from praying anywhere else. Sometimes I come in here and I pray here. Sometimes I sit in that office and I'll own front door lock. Don't even switch the lights on. Don't even put the heat on. Just sit in that room over there and I'll pray. And it's good and it's good. And sometimes I have to get away just to do it. But I have, other, I have a room in my house where I specifically meet with my father. And I know when I sit in that one chair and I know when I'm sitting there, I'm in direct communication. I know it. I'm sitting there. You've got to establish. It's, it's very, very important. If you and I are going to reach up and grab those things God from, has from us, we've got to have a base. We've got to have a secret place. We've got to have one location. Set it up quickly. Get it there for God to do it. And when you get there, see, the most important thing is this quietness. It's in your quiet time that God will talk to you. In the hustle and bustle life, man, if you go through Tesco's or you go through Sainsbury's or wherever you go, they play music all the time. Have you noticed that? You go into the restaurants, they play music. You go to a cafe, they play music. Everywhere you go, you go to somebody's house, the kids is running, the dogs is barking, there's noise, noise, noise. And it's distractions. So you've got to find somewhere to be alone. 
You, you, you look at the Old Testament, you find when, when, when man of God wanted to talk to God, they didn't sit with a whole bunch of people in the midst of the, the, the noise and the dancing. No, they, Moses took himself up onto the mountains. The Lord took himself up onto the mountains. They got alone. Everybody shout alone. And when they got alone, God can deal with you. There's things that happens when you're alone. It's never going to happen in public. These meetings are fantastic and there's an anointing that comes in the house. God promises. I have a scripture on the wall where God promised us in a time of famine, a time of hunger, a time of strife, and a time of war, if we would come to the house of God and stand in the presence of God, he would turn the evil from our door. So I know there's an anointing on the house, but there's nothing like the secret place. There's nothing like this place where you get alone. And when you get yourself away and you get alone, he talks to you. And sometimes he talks to you and you don't want to answer because he just said something to you. There's other times you want to cry, you want to squeal. There's sometimes you just want to say no. And there's other times you'll say yes. But there's nobody in there to hear but you and the Father. And many times I've went in there in times of trouble and times of, of aggravation from the enemy and times when the enemy is against me. And I tell you, I managed a time I've sat down and before I started praying, I said, devil, you have no room in this now. This is my secret place where I'm meeting my daddy and I'm not met, meeting you, so get out in Jesus' name. And then I talk and I know there's only me and daddy there. And then I can pour out my heart. And it doesn't matter if you say it all in the correct manner. It doesn't matter. Sometimes when you're overwhelmed, just, you, you can't hardly get it out for crying. Sometimes your heart is so heavy, you say, God, I, I'd like to sit and pray it in a flowery prayer, but let me just put it this way. Dear God, help me. Have you ever prayed one of them prayers? It's okay for to pray one of them prayers with Daddy. You'll never pray that in public. You'll never pray one of them prayers while everybody listen. You'll never pray one of them prayers while your wife or your husband listen. But when you get alone, you can be real. When you get alone, you could say, I messed it up, Father. Messed it up big time, but your mercy is upon me today. And I thank you, there's no condemnation on my life right now because of the blood of Jesus. But I need help, and I need help, Brian. You can run to him, and he'll hear you. You see, the Bible tells us that Jesus got away from the crowd. He loved to be with the crowd. He was a people person. He was on the, the Sea of Galilee, and he'd get to another shore to meet another people. But continuously, before he ever met the crowd, he was always in the secret place. There he was talking to the Father, removing all distractions. Life will pour out as distractions. Life will pour out as distresses. The problems from the families, the problems from your, from your work, it'll all gather in around you so that your prayer life will be choked. This is why you've got to get away alone. This is why you have a specific place because you're there, you're not. You're only talking to him about your problems. But you know the master of the universe is now listening. You know the shutters up, the doors open, and you're right in the presence of God. And you can say, you're my fortress, you're my refuge, you are my help, a very present help in a time of trouble. You don't have to tell him how to do it. You just say, God, I need help. And, I, and you said you would do this, and you promised me you'd do this, and your word says this, and just talk to him. But as you talk to him, he hears, he listens. And when you walk out the door, it's not you wonder, I wonder, did he hear? You'll just know that you know that you know he heard me. So if he heard me now, the wheels are in motion something good is going to happen to me. And it may not happen the following week, but it will surely happen. God has got your plans out and before him. Your profile is there. He's working for you already now. God already lives in 2016. He's beckoning you in it. He's saying, trust me in this one. He never asked you to understand him. You don't have a brain to understand God. There's not an intellectual individual on the globe that is smart enough to figure God out. There is not. And I want to tell you something. God never asked you to understand him. He just asked you to trust him. And the man and woman who can hear the voice of God is the man and woman that will be led by the Spirit of God. We don't always understand why he says, come on this way. And you say, dear goodness, that's through the wilderness. I don't understand why he didn't wait until Friday when he could have done it on Thursday. I don't understand, but I'm, I've been here long enough to understand this. If I'll just trust him, he'll bring it out for my benefit, and he'll turn that which was meant for evil and turn it out for good. Absolutely. Look at somebody say, God will turn it around for you. If you establish a prayer life and understand this, be very aware that God is with you. 
You see, it it's not, doesn't happen when you're in the hustle and bustle in life. It's when you get alone, you can begin to realize this. And you become aware that he's with you. Did you ever look at the life of the Apostle Paul? I assume that you read the scriptures and you read the life of the Apostle Paul. You know, one day we're going to stand beside that guy. And you're going to look at the marks on him, the, the, the testimonies of the, of the suffering that that guy went through. Did you ever wonder... I wonder, could I have handled what he handled? I, I don't think so. I just think there's a grace on us all to enable us to go through the things we go through. Because there's people, and I sometimes wonder, how do they handle that? How do they live with that? And I realized they couldn't do it unless the grace of God was on them to help them through the situation. So you couldn't do it because the grace isn't on you to do it. He has graced you and put the favor of God for whatever life you have to assist you in where you're going through. But if you take a look in 2 Corinthians, like verse, chapter 11 and verse 22, it says, uh, he, Paul was asking the question, he said, are they Hebrews? And so am I. Are they Israel, uh, from Israelites? He said, so am I. Are they of the seed of Abraham? So am, so am I. Are they ministers of Christ? Well, I speak as a fool. I am more. Then he starts to say what happened to him. He said, I'm in labors, labors more frequent, uh, I'm in labors more abundant. He said, and stripes, uh, that's the stripe where they took him and whipped him and beat his, beat his back. Stripes ab uh, above measure. In other words, it's only the, the, the Jewish system was uh, if they wanted to whip you or beat you, they could only do it to a certain number of stripes. And he was basically saying, what did I tell you? They didn't even count when they were beating me. They just went to the felt like I've had enough. He, he went over and above. In labors abundant, in abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent. He was well known in prison. Paul was in and out of prison, and it wasn't because he was a bad boy, because his witness for the Lord Jesus. In prison, more frequent, in deaths often, in death-defying situations. He said, I found myself there many times. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, except for once. He said, uh, thrice, three times I was beaten with rods. That's like, like, uh, uh, like horse whips. You know, the thund you know a rider will, will hit a horse with a small cane that is a flexible thing for maximum bruising and maximum, maximum hurt? He said, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I suffered shipwreck. You know, someone I'd get a plane the next time. Three times I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I'd been in the deep in the sea. My goodness me. In, in, uh, in pearls, he says, I was, I was uh, in pearls of robbers. In other words, I was mugged. He was mugged in pearls by my own countrymen. People in his own country started to bring him down. In pearls and deep dangers by the heathen, and dangers in the city, and in dangers in the wilderness, and dangers in the sea, and in dangers amongst the false, false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watching off often, in hunger and in thirst, and in fastings often, in cold and in nakedness. And besides all that, besides all that that came without, he said, that which comes upon me daily, even the cares of the church. And I looked at that one day and I said, how did that man go through that? How did he, how did he, what, what type of life has this guy got that can get up on the next day and say, well, I'll go again. A lot of people I know would, uh, on the first sentence, would have give up. Ah, this is too tough for me, but not this guy. Not this guy. See, we can take years, decades, and centuries later, we can read what he said because he didn't quit halfway. He ran his ways. He suffered, and it wasn't for himself, but his suffering became a testimony that his children and his children's children, and down the decades to you and I could read this, and we could take encouragement and say, well, how did you do it, Paul? How did you do it? And one of them things was his prayer life because he knew God was with him. There was a time in detail that went into Acts 27, verse 22, when he was on a shipwreck situation. The storm rose up, the, the, the typhoon was, cyclone was spinning, the, the clouds were black. It had, they haven't even seen daylight for 14 days. They know now the ship's going down. They've already thrown the, thrown the cargo overboard. They have cut down all the, all the seals, the mast is gone, just leaving a boat. And they're at the mercy of the sea and there's no sign of this thing stopping. And they're about to, they're about to just kill the prisoners and jump overboard. And, and he stood up and he said, now I exhort you. Be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. How could you be a cheer when you're on a single HMS or RMS Titanic? And you're on it and it's, it's about to go down and he gets up and he says, just keep on smiling. Look at somebody say, there's good news for you. Keep on smiling. 
Keep on smiling, fellas. For listen, he says, for there'll be no loss of this ship, no loss of any man's life but the ship. The ship's going down, but nobody's going to die. And he said this, and this is exquisite, what he said. He said, there, he said, for there stood by me this night the angel of the Lord. There's some translations actually said it was the Lord himself. And I'm willing to believe it was the Lord himself. That in the midst of his deep crisis, a death-defying situation, the Lord appeared to him. The angel of the Lord appeared unto him, he said, and whose I am and whose I am served, saying this to me, fear not, Paul. Fear not, Paul. Look at somebody say, fear not. Fear not. Look at somebody say, quit your worrying. Here's a guy faith in a situation that you and I probably have never faced. And God came to him and said, fear not. Quit your worrying. Put a smile on, Paul. Uh, he says, for you must be brought before Caesar. In other words, I told you you're going, so you're going to go there. And lo, God has given you all these men that sail with you. Therefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as was told me. And he was fully aware that God was with him every single step of the way. He was well aware when he kneeled in prayer and in a secret place that God heard him. Do you know it yet? Because when you know God heard me, I tell you, you may not get the answer this week or next week, but when you know God hear you, you can go on and you can keep on trucking because you know it's on its way. It may take a week, it may take a month, but you know it'll get there. If I don't quit, I'll run head on into it. It's already last heaven. I tell you, the, the, that, that, the transveyor belt that's got all the goodies on is already switched on go. It's on its way. Many people give up. They give up short. They give, just before the breakthrough comes, they sit down and it's all over and don't bother to get up again. Then they scratch their head and try to blame it on everybody and everything when it's really themselves. They give up too soon. It's always too soon to give up. When you get a prayer life and begin to realize God hears me, He's with me, He never leaves me, He never forsakes me, He never leaves you alone. He will never reject you. He will never turn around and say, well, I'm not talking to you today. He will never turn around and say, well, who are you? He may turn around and say, I thought you'd never come. <laughs> no, 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 no. He never turns you away. David knew it. David quoted it and wrote it down in Psalm 23, verse 4. He says, yeah. He said, I know what it's like to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I know it. I know it. I know it. He said, but I can tell you if I ever have to walk down that way again, he said, I'll fear no evil. I will fear no evil. And the reason he said it, he says, because I know, Father, you're with me. Your rod and your staff is out there to comfort me every step of the way. I, I, I can't sit down in this situation. I can't sit down in the valley of death. I can't give up. I can't turn to the left or turn. I've just got to keep on walking. Look at somebody say, keep on walking. If you sit down in the midst of it, you could die in a desert. You just got to keep on, keep on, keep on. And knowing that he keep on going, God will send this person. He'll send that person. He'll open a door. He'll do things. This is what he does. Jesus told us ahead of time, and he told his disciples ahead of time, he said, fellas, i got to go. It's expedient that I go away. If I don't go away, then this next thing can't happen. He said, if I go away, they didn't even know who the Comforter was. They didn't know who the Holy Spirit was. And Jesus gave a revelation. He said, i got to go, guys. I've got to go. He said, but if I go, you may think you'll be left comfortless, but you won't. Because when I go, he said, I'm going to send the comforter, another helper, just the same as me. I'm going to send him, and he's going to be with you, and he's going to be with you forever. Let me read it to you in John 14 and verse 16. He said, I'll pray the Father. And he said, and he shall give you another comforter that is one the same as me. An exact replica. He said, he said I'll give you another comforter, listen to this, that he may abide with you forever. You will never be alone. The day you bowed your knee to the Lord Jesus Christ, you took a companion on alongside that said, you may want rid of me, but you'll never get rid of me because I'll always be there. I'll always be there. When you're going through the valleys, when you're taking the shortcuts, when life's turned upside down, the boat's flipping over, when nothing's working, I'm still there. I am still there. And as long as he's still there, there will always be a way of escape. He's always one step ahead of us. You and I have got to learn to jump when he says jump. Stop when he says stop. You've got to learn it. This is a continual walk with him. And if you will learn to do that, 
He said, I'll, I'll send you the comfort. The Holy Spirit will come. And he said, he'll lead you into all truth. He'll show you the way. Now the world cannot receive him because it sees him not, neither does it know him, but you know him. And for he dwells within you and he shall be in you. And he said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will not leave you like orphans. I will not leave you helpless. He said, I will come unto you in the form of the Holy Spirit. I'll come to you. He's right there with you, folks. He's right there with you, leading, opening doors, making new ways. I, I know this, no matter what I'm facing, no matter what I'm going through, there's always a better day ahead. I refuse to sit down with the dark clouds of despair. I refuse to sit down with depression in my spirit. I refuse to sit down. Many times you've got to talk to yourself. You've got to stand in front of the mirror and say, for goodness sake, catch yourself on. Look at somebody and say, catch yourself on. Sometimes you've just got to say it. Now, now, like if your wife says it to you, you wouldn't talk to her for a month. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes you've got to talk to yourself and say, what are you playing at? What are you doing? What are you, what are you thinking? That? What are you talking that way for? Come on, get up. Sometimes you just got to talk to yourself. Sometimes you've got to get away out there into the woods or take a walk along the Craig Avon Lakes when there's no, make sure there's nobody about. But when there's nobody about, just give yourself a good talk and tell say, for goodness sake. God's in this. He'll see us through. Come on now. Quit that world. I don't want to hear you talking about that anymore. People walking past you think you're crazy. But you're, who cares? I've told you before, the quickest way to get your phone out. They don't know you're not talking to anybody. <laughs> talk on your phone and dial your own number and talk to yourself. Listen to me when I'm talking to you. You better get your act together. If you think you're going to take me down, you've got another thing coming. We're coming through this. We're overcoming this. Money's on its way. If it doesn't come by Tuesday, it'll be here by Friday. But I'm telling you, and don't talk back to me when I'm talking. We're going to make it. <laughs> and hang the phone up real quick and put it in your pocket and say, that told him. <laughs> and people walk past you and say, that's it, that's it, that's it. Go for it, go for it. Now, if your best friend talked to you like that, they wouldn't be your best friend anymore. But sometimes you just got to do it. If you don't, you'll just sit back and I don't know. Well, I do. You're going nowhere until you pull yourself up by the bootstraps and say, just a minute, I'm not going to live like this. I'm not going to think like this. I'm not going to do this anymore. That was me yesterday. This is me today. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, Joe, really? Yes, really. Because if you don't. There's a wilderness out there. And if you're going, even if God brings you through the wilderness, you've got to keep on walking until you get there. You're a trophy in the hands of God. If God trusts you to walk you in there, if God says, we're going through the lion's son, just smile and say, well, I need to bring kitty cat with me. <laughs> he didn't stop Daniel from going into the lions. He just said, I'll be with you when you get there. Enjoy the view. Take a selfie. <laughs> me and big Leo over here. The lion ate everybody else. Do you think Daniel didn't have a quiver in his liver? Do you, did, you think it didn't turn over on the inside? Do you think he didn't, didn't have this moment? I'm sure he did. But God told him, he says, don't fear, Leo. When you get in there, I'll sort it out for you. God didn't stop him from going in. I don't think God put him in. But God didn't stop him from going in. But when he got there, he saw the magnificence, how God could silence the lion in the midst of it. Come on. You got to talk yourself in and you got to talk yourself out. I think probably, you probably talked yourself into it in the first place. That's why you're in the mess you're in. So you got to, if you can talk yourself in, you can talk yourself out. Get your conversation around and get these words on your lips. God has not left me. I am not alone. The one who holds all the answers to this dilemma is walking with me. He is in me. I will find a way through this. I will not settle to it's over. I will not rest. I may have to fast. I may have to pray. I may have to push some things to the side. But I'm coming through. Everybody shout, I'm coming through. And, 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 and this is why he sent us the Holy Spirit in Romans 8 and 26. It says, likewise, the Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, he helpeth with our infirmities or our, or our weaknesses. He says, for we know not what we should pray as we ought. There is times when we pray, pray, just don't know how to pray. I, I, I don't know if you've ever been there. I've been there at times. And I mean, I know how to pray most times. But there's situations, times in your life when you say, I don't even know how to pray. But that's why he sent the Holy Spirit. So when you pray in the Holy Ghost, and you pray in tongues, 
You're praying the perfect prayer because you don't have to think about it. It comes directly from your innermost parts. goes directly to the Father. Did you don't have to interpret it. You just pray in tongues. And, and, and you're praying over that situation. God's answering and going to it. So when you, when you get your prayer life and you get it right and understand when you're praying, He's with you. You're not talking to hot air. Now, when I was young and inexperienced, I, one time I, I, I said to the Holy Spirit, because people would tell you, you've got to do it this way. And I, well, I got before the Holy Spirit and I said, I don't know how to do these things. I, 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 I just don't know how to do it. I, I said, but Holy Spirit, will you help me? Could you teach me? I remember asking one time and I said, I don't know how to love God. I don't know how to do it. How, how do you do that? I, I, but I, I said, Holy Spirit, would you teach me how to tell the Father I love him? Would you teach me that my life would be a, 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 a simulation to the Lord, that he would see that I love him? Would you, would you teach me? You know, the Holy Spirit doesn't get offended by you saying that. He welcomes that because you buy to him and you say, teach me. He said, I'll be your teacher, I'll be your helper. And so many times I've said to him, I, I don't know what to do. But he said, I'll teach you, Joe. I'll teach you. If you will stay teachable, he can teach you many things. It's the ones who know it all gets nowhere. It's the ones who remain pliable in the hands of lords that can do things. And, 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 and the second thing is about it is this. When you experience that it's not in your strength that you get the things done, but it's in the Lord's strength. That's where you get the answers. When Paul, the Apostle Paul, who was beaten, we read about he was beaten, he was jailed. And, and when you're thrown in jail, you think, man, you'd become negative and you'd become nasty and you'd criticize and you'd tear apart the church. You know, the very churches that that man established didn't even want him. At one time, he had to get out of, get out of town in a hurry. And it wasn't, the, it wasn't the heathen that was wanting him, it was the church folks. Didn't want him anymore. And he had to go. He had to get out of town in a hurry. Now, he established another pastor called Timothy. And he sent Timothy in to pastor that church. And Timothy was able to do it. And Timothy was able to, to raise that church. It became one of the biggest churches in those days. Young Timothy, we got the, the letters that Apostle Paul, senior pastor Paul, wrote to the young pastor called Timothy. It's called First and Second Timothy in our gospel. They were simply a letter, two letters. Two letters that, that, that Paul wrote to the young man. And, and told them how to run the church, what to do about the situations that was going in church. So, so they, they didn't even understand the man they didn't want to run it was still running it, but running it from afar. But wouldn't you think like the people who turn on you and your best friends turn on you, that that you established no longer wants you? Wouldn't you have every right to get bitter? And now your world, all you're doing is simply preaching and telling people the good news and helping them through their destiny. The very people that's done that has sold you out, betrayed you, and now you're in a prison. Now you're in prison. Wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't you have every opportunity now to become bitter? Wouldn't you have every opportunity now to turn and say, forget about this gospel thing, wouldn't you? Because there's a lot of people do, but not Paul. It didn't matter if he was in prison or in the palace. It didn't matter where he was up in the sassy elephant drinking coffee <laughs> or he was in Kofolas and Lurgan eating fish and chips. It doesn't matter where he was. He was always the same, the most positive individual that you could ever sit with. He had often, always good, often good to something to say. And when he was in prison, he still wrote letters to churches. He wrote a letter to the church of Philippi who were struggling. And he wrote just one, one little line in here. He wrote a whole bunch of stuff. He wrote one line and he said this. He said, fellas, I want you to know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm in a prison, but what does it matter? I can still be strong in here. Strong in the Lord. He said, I can do this because God is going to help me. I can be strong, Lord. When he wrote to the church of Ephesus, he said, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Be strong in the Lord. Our strength's not in him, not in us. Our strength is in the Lord. And the sooner you learn how to depend on him, the quicker you will get things done. You've got to learn to have a prayer life and you've got to learn how to depend on him. Have you got that? Amen. Get the last one now. The Bible says in James <clears throat> verse 5, in verse 16, I think we'll try another, maybe next Sunday morning we'll go at this again in a different mention. I just more thoughts kept coming to my as I was preaching that, so I'll maybe go at this from a different angle. But I want to finish it with this angle tonight. In James 5 and 16, now it says, listen, have you, have you got it? Well done, well done. Who's doing that tonight? Hannah? Yes, well done. Confess your faults one to another. Now, now listen to me. We would need to take time to explain that because you would need to watch who you tell your faults to. Are you with me? 
Look at somebody and say, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> ah, yes. Because that person you tell may not be delivered from gossip at this point. And before you know it, everybody else knows now nah, the simple little weakness that goes on in your life. You know, many, many years ago, whenever I was a young person's leader, and, and uh, it was one Sunday, Sunday night, I, I remember I said to young people after church, which were early, which, no, it's nothing to do with this church. <laughs> anyway, it was a Sunday night, and I said to all young people, I said, come on, listen, listen, let's go for a walk around the legs, and we'll, and we'll laugh, and we'll talk, and joke the whole way around the legs. So off we went around the legs. And, and we're all talking, and Laura and I was holding on to each other, linking each other, several other young couples was there linking each other arm, and we're all walking around. And then there's this young fellow who was in front of us, and he, was, he had a young lady on his arm. They weren't married, they were just going with each other. And she turned around and said to me, I have a real weakness in my life, Pastor. I said, have you indeed? <laughs> I said, now what would that be? Thinking it was just something ordinary. She says, I have this awful weakness for men. Well, I tell you, I watched every other young girl hang tighter onto her fella and move slightly this way, you know, so they get way out of her road. I said, is that a fact? <laughs> Almost lost the whole young people. And one people was walking backwards, people's way over this direction. And uh, so you have to be careful who you tell your weaknesses to. And it actually, it doesn't actually mean that that, that way you see it. It simply means that I can't do this alone. Look at somebody say, I can't do this alone. I can't. I need help. I need other people around me. I need the support of people. I need you. Look at somebody. Now, you, now this is not who you say this to now. You just look at somebody and say, I may need you later. <laughs> Absolutely, I, I may need you later. Look at somebody and say, I may need you sooner than you think. But you need someone. Listen, I need people. You need people. See, see you've got to understand, this is not a conference. This is not a, this is not a fire everybody up conference because conference is different from church because church is family. Amen. Church is family. Get a hold of this. this is not, conference is not family. Conference is we're going down and we're springing from the chandeliers and we have Pentecostal shakes and all the rest of it. <laughs> but this is, the church is not like, church is family. This is where we can come in and, and hear what God has to say and understand who we are. We, we're for each other. We're for each other. We understand you're not perfect. Look at somebody say, we know that, we know that. <laughs> we know you're not perfect. And we know there's times, and because we're with each other for years upon years upon years, there's times you know I'm going through troubles. There's times I know you're going through troubles. Now, we don't get up and sprout them off, and very seldom they ever tell you about the stuff I'm going through. I wouldn't burden you with it. But there's intercessors who do know the things we go through and helps us through. I need people. I can't do this on my own. I need Laura, she needs me, we need the kids, they need us. But I need you, and unfortunately, you need me. <laughs> you just need me in your life. You need the joker, you need the clown, you need the teacher, you need whatever I am up here, but you need me to help you through the crisis in life. And because we're family, God put us together to help one another through it. So he wrote this one, he says, confess your faults one to another. Or just let each other know, I need you. Try that one more time. Just look at them and say, I need you. And you just pray for one another. Listen to this. Confess your faults one to another. And then listen to this. And pray for one another. And pray for one another that you may be healed. So he put the healing of an individual linked to another person praying for you. He got that? He said, we got these weaknesses and faults. If I was 100% strength, I wouldn't need anybody else to pray for me. Consistently, I, over the holidays, I, I, I took ill. And, and I had to go for Laura, humbling experience, and say, Laura, would you, would you lay hands on me? She said, <laughs> I said, no, not quite that way. I said, I, I really trouble here. I'm hurting, I'm in pain. And she prayed for me, and then I, I'd go and, and cry in the corner somewhere else. I'd come back and say, could you pray for me again? And she'd say, I prayed for you. I'm go. I said, no, but I need more prayer. So, so you got to understand if it was all just me touching daddy, we could get the job done. God made it in such a way that you need each other. You need the fellowship. You need the church. Now, you don't need people that's against you. You don't need negative people. You don't need people that's going to laugh at you and mock at you. There's enough of that going on in the world. But you need people, people who will genuinely, with a heart of concern, 
go before the Father during the week and say, God, will you bless them this week? And God can touch you to touch somebody else, to write a scripture to somebody, send a text to somebody, just help somebody in their hour of need. And he put it, the book of James puts it this way. It says, confess your faults to one another. Let each other know you need each other and then pray for one another that you may be healed. It says that the, that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man, it availeth much or it counts for much. It said then, then uh, uh, Elijah was a man subject to passions like as we are. No, he's just a man of desire, just the same as the rest of us. And he said, but he prayed and for the rain not to come and it didn't rain for the space of three and a half years. <sighs> I don't want him to pray for me. Anyway, he said, but he prayed again. And then the heavens uh, began to rain and the earth brought forth her fruit. In other words, a breakthrough came. A man was able to pray. And the, the, the scriptures put him, in, put him right in here at this particular scripture by praying for each another. Because he's saying the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man faileth much. There's a translation that says the effectual fervent prayer, prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its workings. He's talking to ordinary people. Look at somebody say, you're an ordinary person. He's talking to you and he's likening you onto a prayer that Elijah prayed and said, you can do the same. Look at somebody say, did, did I hear him right? Yes, you did. Because this is what the Bible says. It says that you have the ability to pray same prayers as Elijah and the God who answered Elijah can answer you. And he put this in the same context as praying for one another so that you can be healed. Look at somebody say you're a mighty man or a mighty woman of God. Just go ahead and tell them that. Look at somebody say you're a mighty man or a mighty woman of God. Absolutely. That you have the ability to pray for breakthroughs. You have the ability to pray and a breakthrough will come. Now I understand this. There's gifts of God and there's offices that God puts us into. I understand that. And there's those who's used uh, more consistently and, and then we see the fruits of their labor. So we, we would kind of always go to them at the same time because we know they get results. But you've got to start somewhere. You've got to start somewhere. And the Bible says every single person has an ability like Elijah had to pray for somebody else's breakthroughs. So I know there's people in here and you can pray for people for breakthroughs and financial breakthroughs will come. Look at somebody say, I believe I could do that. Some of you went quiet. Some of you said, Jan. Some of you have the ability to pray for the sick and the sick will recover. Look at somebody say, that's me, that's me. Some of you have the ability to pray for household salvation and household salvation will come. Look at somebody say, that's you. Some people has the ability to pray for somebody to get a job and jobs will come. I don't have all the ability. I know like I look like I have all the ability, but I don't. And I learned a long time ago there's what you call the body of Christ. Because if it's down to one man, what if one man feels, then the church feels. So God never put it all in one man. He spread it out through the body. He put gifts in particular into people's lives. You're as gifted as the rest of them. There's talents and abilities inside you that we'll probably never seen or will never know. We're not talking about your job description in your CV. I'm just talking about you as a spiritual being, a child of the living God, and you have already fought the good fight of faith. You have contended with hell itself, and you've got breakthroughs. If you didn't have the breakthroughs, you wouldn't even be here. If the enemy could have killed you six years ago, you'd be dead, buried, and gone. The fact that you're still here is because you, you wouldn't stop kicking, you wouldn't stop squealing, and you kept on hanging on to God, even though you didn't know all the right prayers to pray, but you just kept shouting, help! And God kept answering, and you're still alive. Look at somebody saying, you're looking good. <clears throat> and I've often found if you, can get the, if you can get mastery over one area, that that you've just fought is not flesh and blood, but it's principalities and powers. And if you overcome it one time, you can overcome it a thousand times because you've got mastery over it. And I've always found this, if you've got mastery in one area, you can get it in other people's areas too. So when I find people that has breakthroughs, I'd be the first to turn around and say, put your hand right there. Get me one of them breakthroughs. So you got a breakthrough in your family? Please pray for mine. Look at somebody say, I'm mine too. So you got your husband saved? Well, I would have to ask somebody else to pray for us. You know, find out who's got it. Has anybody had a breakthrough in here? Has anybody ever had a breakthrough? I thought I was in the wrong church there for a minute. How can you preach for all these years? These people have no breakthroughs. Let me tell you what again. How many people has ever had a breakthrough in their life? Okay. Whatever area you got that breakthrough, 
You had to defeat principalities and powers to get it. If you defeated a principality and power, then that principality and power doesn't want to touch you again. It is afraid of you. You now have mastery over it. And if you have mastery over it yesterday, you can master over it tomorrow. Are you with me? And if you have mastery over it on your one, in your life, you can have mastery over it in my life as long as I could agree with you for it. Have you got a hold of that? And this is why the Bible says that you and I are to pray for one another because you've got victories that I have never had. I've had victories that you have never had. But if I could pray for you and you could pray for me, we could have a whole bunch of stuff going on in a hurry. Does this sound good tonight? Amen. Robbie, run into my office right there. There's, there's about five, four, four or five sheets of paper on my, my, my office desk there. Please uh, uh, bring them to me quickly. <laughs> I know. Get me an alligator sandwich and make it snappy. Okay. <laughs> yes. Don't know where that came from. It's probably out of a Christmas cracker. So we're going to do this. We're going to pray for one another. We're going to pray. Are you okay for praying for one another? Yeah, you will be. You will be. You know, there come a time the church will get so big, you won't be able to do it like this. But you're among family tonight, and we can do it. I got uh, one, two, three, four. Got five headings. This one's called relationships. This one's called ministry. This one's called says prosper, but it's really prosperity. This one's called health. Health. And this one's called breakthrough. We are going to, we have prayed for each other in these buildings before. And how we're going to, please don't get nervous if you're not used to this type of thing. Please don't get nervous. We're not embarrassing anybody. Just you in particular, but don't worry about it. Now, so it's, I just wait, hang on with me. We'll not embarrass anybody. What we're going to do is we're going to ask five people to hold these sheets up, okay? Different locations of the room. And whatever that, like for this instance, relationships. Relationships will have to do with, with uh, uh, marital situations. Children that's wayward. The prodigal sons, the prodigal daughters. Uh, relationships, families, household salvation. If your dilemma tonight was be a husband. If your dilemma is your spouse. If your dilemma is your children. If your deepest hard tonight it was for household salvation, then this uh, particular region would be where you would like to be for somebody to pray. Uh, the world well, ministry, for instance, ministry's got to do with people who would like to be, who's got this deep des desire to serve God, to, to be, to go, to do anything that's got to do with ministry. The prosperity's got to do with debt, got to do with finances, got to do with you have so much, so much of it you don't know what to do with it anymore. This has got anything to do with finances, this one. This one's got to do with health for those that's either going through crisis. Uh, we, got, we prayed here this morning for Sylvia. Uh, I sent her a text this afternoon. I don't make phone calls on Sunday afternoon because it's, it's uh, a, a Sunday afternoon. I'm busy seeking God on what to do at the night service. We're doing it this way tonight because I heard the Spirit of the Lord directly saying this is how to do this. Uh, so uh, we prayed for Sylvia this morning and she said the whole thing lifted off her. That, that sickness was, was going through, it lifted off her. So we already got a breakthrough. The other one was Pastor Neil. We're praying for him. It's like a chest infection <coughs> sat on him. You know this is the first year in three years that I've been here in the first of the new year. Because the last two years I had chest infections and he had to preach on behalf of me. So I'm just, I'm just happy I'm up here sprouting off tonight. So this one says health. You know it's anything to do with healing. And this one's got to do with breakthroughs. Anything that comes under the head of breakthroughs is where you need to stand. We're going to put, we're going to, I'm going to give them to four people. And there are five people that are going to stand in five different locations. It's not that the person holding this is anointed to pray for you. That's not. The deal, the deal. The deal is that we pray for one another. It's just that when you're standing under this particular sheet, it means that anything we're praying for under, the, when we're standing here, anything we're standing under here, we've got to do with relationship issues. So you pray for one another. So you just grab a hold of some, when maybe four or five people may be standing there, just grab a hold of them and pray with them. And if you don't know what to pray with them, just say, God bless you and your family. 
You know, we're not asking for Jesus. But there is people who can pray. You may be praying for household salvation. You may want to say to somebody, oh, pray for my husband. You may not want to. Don't get into long conversations. That defeats the thing. Just pray. But whatever, whatever banner you're standing under, the people stand under, that's their prayer request. So if you'll just lay hands on somebody that stand under and say, God bless their family. Whatever way God does it, will you just do it? This one's got ministry. Maybe people that wants to be in ministry. It's maybe people in ministry that struggle. I, I believe that God's going to break, break people loose into ministry this year. Like never before. This was prosperity. Please don't get into people's businesses and don't be telling people what you owe and all the rest of it. You just call it debt. Everybody has it. Nobody, nobody cares anymore. So if you're going to the prosperity and you just, just, if you're praying with somebody else, just pray for God to release financial benefits to them for breakthroughs, jobs or whatever. Or if it's just breakthroughs, if, you, if you're into just praying for breakthroughs, just call to breakthrough. God give them a breakthrough. And you'll be praying for one hour. Do you think you can do that? I know you can do it. Look at somebody say, he knows you can do that. So let, let's, 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 let's choose people here. I'm going to say again, uh, that just because they're holding this sheet does not mean they're going to pray for you. They'll be praying too. It's just they're, just, they're just a mic stand that's holding the sheet, okay? And they're just simply holding it there to let you know this, under this place is where anybody stand under here. We're praying for each other for healing. Is that okay? Is that simple enough? Do you want me to say it in French? Okay, now... Uh, Spanish? No, okay. Laura, Laura, come you here. Stand you at the front there and hold that. Now I know you're looking at Laura and you say, she's going to pray for me. No, she's not. Laura, you're not praying for anybody. She's not. You're going to pray for each other. Anybody stands under that has got a health problem. Or you're standing under this for somebody. And when you come to somebody and maybe six people stand there, just lay hands on somebody. Say, let he be healed, be healed. Whatever way you want to do it. She may lay hands on everybody that moves, breathes and squeals. But that's the way she goes. Now, Garth, come here and hold breakthroughs. So if you need a breakthrough, look at somebody say, you, need, you look like you need a breakthrough. Now, if you need a breakthrough, that just comes about everything. You stand over there. And so if you need a breakthrough in the next few minutes, then you will need to shuffle your way over here. And whoever comes over, just grab somebody. Say, I'm believing for your breakthrough. Because the Bible says about the book of Job that when he prayed for his friends, he immediately got his release. You got a hold of that? So you just say, you don't have to pray long prayers. You just say, be healed, find us, whatever it is. And you'll find God will release it to you as you're doing it. Look at somebody say, this is so exciting. All right, Brenda, come here and hold this one. This one's got to go, you, Brenda. Use this one. Get, hold that for her because she's moving that slow. Get you mad. Here, look. That one's called relationships. Stand you over by the radio.